In chapter 19, we'll be performing our first inferential statistics method. Now remember from the previous chapter, inference is when we take a sample and we use that sample to make some kind of conclusion or estimate about the population as a whole. In this chapter, we'll be creating something called a confidence interval. Thinking back to the empirical rule from unit one, we know that in a normal distribution, 68% of the data falls within one standard deviation of the mean or of the proportion as we learned in the last chapter, 95% falls within two standard deviations and 99.7% within three standard deviations. This also applies to samples, which means if we take a sample from a population, there's a 95% chance that the true population parameter is within two standard deviations of that sample statistic. Let me explain this a different way, because what I'm explaining right now is called a 95% confidence interval. Let's say we're talking about the percentage of people who have blue eyes, and that's represented by this green line right here, and the actual percentage of people who have blue eyes is 20% made up number. All right, we take a number of samples of size 100. So we take 100 people and we find out that 28 of them have blue eyes. That's this red dot. Okay, we take another sample. This time we get 23 of them having blue eyes. Every time we take a sample, we get a different number of people that have blue eyes. That's a sample statistic. Statistics vary. Population parameters, this green line, don't vary. There's a certain percentage of people who have blue eyes. That's a fact. Okay, off of each of these red dots, we have these two blue lines. This is representing moving away from our sample statistic to standard deviations. So on all of these red dots, we move away to standard deviations and we're creating a confidence interval. And what we're saying is that we're 95% sure that within that upper and lower boundary here to here, we're capturing that true population parameter, that green line, okay? It's not gonna happen every time. In fact, in this interval right here, it doesn't catch it. In this one, it doesn't catch it. Um, that's okay. We expect that 95% of the time we will catch it. The other 5% of the time we won't catch it. We always start a confidence interval by taking a sample and getting a result from that sample. That gives us our sample statistic p hat, and in a 95% confidence interval, we're moving two standard deviations away from that sample statistic. The p hat is called the point estimate. It's our best guess about what the population parameter actually is if we don't have any other information. And the amount that we're moving away from that point estimate is called the margin of error. This is the general form for every confidence interval, point estimate plus and minus a margin of error. The wider this margin of error is, the more confident we are that our interval actually contains the true population proportion. For example, in June 2004, 909 registered voters were asked if there was some chance they could vote for other candidates in the presidential election besides their expressed first choice. Only 18% indicated that there was some chance that they might switch. So in this problem, this 18% is our point estimate. That's the starting point for our confidence interval. The resulting 95% confidence interval is 0.18 plus minus 0.025. The 0.025 is our margin of error. Write and interpret the actual interval. All we have to do here is take this 0.18, subtract 0.025. That gives us the lower end of our interval and then do the same thing with adding 0.025. Okay, we get 15.5% to 20.5%. What we're actually saying here is that we're 95% confident that in June 2004, between 15.5% and 20.5% of all voters would be willing to switch their vote to another candidate. Remember, this is about a sample Okay, every time we take another sample, that's going to change. This is about the whole population of all voters. Here are a number of different ways that we can incorrectly interpret our confidence interval. To start, number one, in the sample of 909 registered voters, somewhere between 15.5% and 20.5% of them said that there's a chance that they might switch votes. Incorrect because in the sample of 909 voters, we know very specifically that 18% of them said they might switch votes. It's what our confidence interval is built on. When we get this result, this is about the population of all voters. This is inference when we take a sample and we're making some kind of conclusion about a whole population of people. Number two, 
we are 95% confident that 18% of all US registered voters had some chance of switching votes. Incorrect because we we were 95% confident that between 15.5% and 20.5% might switch votes, not 18%. Number three, 95% of all US registered voters had some chance of switching votes. This is just incorrect. Okay, that 95% is about our confidence level in our interval. This isn't even addressing our interval. Number four, we know that between 15.5% and 20.5% might switch votes. We don't know for sure. And this last one is the correct one. So we've been talking about this 95% confidence interval, and I keep saying that we're moving two standard deviations or standard errors away from the sample statistic. That two is coming from the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, okay? So 95% of our data is within two standard deviations of the mean. There's a more precise value that we can use. The two is really just an estimate so we can do these problems quickly. If we actually use inverse normal in our graphing calculator, we're gonna get a more exact value for a 95% confidence interval. We're talking about 95% being in the middle of our distribution. Remember, anytime we use inverse normal, we're looking for area of the left to the left. We want a z-score for this value right here. Now, 95% is in the middle, and there's also some area on this side. There's 5% outside of the middle. Half of it is over here, 2.5%. The other half is over here, other 2.5%. Okay, that means everything to the left of this is 97.5% or 0.975. We would put that in our calculator in an inverse norm and we get 1.96. That's the actual value that we would use. It's called the critical value. We would denote it with Z star. And we can use this to find a, a critical value for any confidence level, whether it's 90%, 99%, those are the most common ones, uh, but 92%, 96%, any value would work. For example, a 90% confidence interval has a critical value, whoops, that's a 90 here, of 1.645, because we're putting in 95% to the left of that value and we would get 1.645. All right, try those two. Find a critical z-score for a 99% confidence interval and a 92% confidence interval. We will go over those tomorrow. These assumptions and conditions should look familiar because to create a confidence interval, we actually create a sampling distribution around the sample that we've taken. So we check randomization, 10%, and since it's a proportion problem, we check the success failure condition. Being that these conditions are met, we're gonna create our interval using this equation right here. P hat plus minus our critical z-score, that's from our confidence level, times the standard error of P hat. It's a standard error because in these problems, we won't know what the true population parameter is. We'll only be working with a sample. Standard deviation is the same thing we've been using, except we have hats over our P's and our Q's here because they're sample values instead of parameter values. So let's actually create an interval from start to finish. In May 2002, the Gallup poll asked 537 randomly sampled adults the question, generally speaking, do you believe the death penalty is applied fairly or unfairly in this country today? Of these, 53% answered fairly and 47% said unfairly or they didn't know. Create a 95% confidence interval to estimate the true proportion of adults who believe the death penalty is applied fairly. Does this interval suggest that the majority believes that the death penalty is fair? So we have our point estimate up here of 53%. It's based on our sample. And we're going to use that point estimate to create our confidence interval. Now, anytime we write an interval, there's a number of different things we need to include to make sure that we get all the points that are possible on an FRQ. And there's a mnemonic device that I'm gonna have you use, and that way you don't panic when you see a confidence interval question. So we wanna to remember to define the parameter, check the assumptions, name the method, write the interval, and write the conclusion. First, define the parameter, and I'm gonna take a few extra seconds to drill this in since it's important. Up here, we have a statistic. This 53% is based on a random sample of 537 randomly selected adults. If we wrote it out, we would use p hat, since it's a sample, equals 
53%, or 0.53. If we took another sample of 537 adults, we would likely get something different than that 53%. That's because samples vary, statistics vary with the samples. Parameters, on the other hand, do not vary. There's some proportion of adults in the country that believe the death penalty is applied fairly. That's what we're trying to estimate with a confidence interval. So when we define the parameter, we would say, let P represent the true proportion of adults in May 2002 who believe the death penalty is applied fairly. Really, you can just take the text from the problem up here and use that to define your parameter. Most importantly, make sure it's clear that this is about the population and not the sample. A, check the assumptions and conditions. This is just like we did with sampling distributions. Randomization, the 537 adults were sampled randomly. 537 is less than 10% of all adults. And success fail, we check the success and failures and state that we expect at least 10 of each. The N in panic is for name the method. There's a number of different confidence intervals that we'll be learning. They all have their own names. This one is called a one proportion Z interval. It's a proportion problem. The one is because we have one sample and the Z is because we're using a Z score to create the interval. I is write the interval. I'm gonna show you how the math is done behind this, but normally we're gonna let our calculator do all the work. First thing we need is a standard deviation. Because we don't have the true population proportion, we're creating a standard error. So we have p hat q hat 0.53 times 0.47 over our sample size, square root it, we get a standard error of 0.0125. We also need a critical z score for a 95% confidence interval. 95% is in the middle of the normal curve. We're going to add in this tail on the left. That's another 2.5%, which is half of the 5% that's left over. The other 2.5% is over here. We want the z-score for this line, which means we would go into inverse normal, and we would put in 0.975. That gives us our critical z-score of 1.96. We're going to use that to create our interval. P hat's our point estimate. That's 53%. Plus minus. The z-score, 1.96, which we got from doing inverse normal on that area, and the standard error, which we got right here. Okay, this is our margin of error. Multiply it, and we get 0.0422. Add and subtract that to 53%, and we get our interval. Lastly, the C in panic, write the conclusion. This follows the same form for every different type of confidence interval that we learn. We are 95% confident that the true proportion of all adults who believe the death penalty is applied fairly lies between 48.8% and 57.2%. While it's not part of panic, we always want to make sure we answer the question. In this case, the question is, does the interval suggest that a majority believes the death penalty is fair? So when we look at our interval, we see that we have values ranging from 48.8% to 57.2%. We have values on both sides of 50%, but most of our interval is above 50%. Okay, that does not matter. What matters is that we have values on both sides of 50%. Right, so because our interval includes both minority and majority support, all of those values are equally likely. Okay, there's no, uh, we don't give the majority side more weight because there's more of them in our interval. So we would write something like, our interval includes values both above and below 50%, all of which are equally plausible. This sample does not provide sufficient evidence that a majority of adults believe the death penalty is applied fairly. For us to make that conclusion, we would wanna see our interval shift to the right and be entirely above 50%, where both the lower side and the upper side show majority support or a majority believing that the death penalty is fair.